party. Slow party. Slow.
Uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome, bienvenue, willkommen, to the Ulster Memorial Tower. For those who have uh, not been here before, I'd like to provide some background to today's commemoration. On the 1st of July 1916, this hillside was a scene of carnage and devastation. For the previous seven days, artillery had been shelling enemy trenches, the British front line was in Thiepful Wood behind you. You've seen it on your way in. And this site was on the German front line. On the hill behind the tower was the Schwaben Redoubt, a heavily fortified position dominating the surrounding area. The 36th Ulster Division had moved into its attack positions in Thiepful Wood the previous night. The battalions of the division were largely formed from the county battalions of the Ulster Volunteer Force formed to fight against home rule. So they were PALS battalions, and often known by their county titles. At 7.15 in the morning, the troops left their trenches and lay in no man's land. At 7.30, as the barrage lifted and moved on to the German second line, the whistles and bugles sounded to begin the attack. The race for the parapet had begun. Could the Ulstermen reach the enemy lines before the Germans, in their bunkers 30 feet down, reached the surface and brought their machine guns to bear? On the other side of the River Ancre, over this way here, the attacks by the 12th Royal Irish Rifles, the Mid Antrim Men, and the 9th Battalion of the Royal Irish Fusiliers from Armagh, Monaghan, and Cavan found the enemy wire largely intact and the gaps covered by Maxim machine guns. Despite fierce fighting, both attacks were stopped with substantial casualties. The 13th Rifles from County Down attacked up the slope to your left here. And they were cut down by machine guns from Beaumont Hamel on the other side of the valley. The 11th Rifles, the men from South Antrim, backed by the 15th Rifles from North Belfast, attacked up the slope to the immediate right here and being further away from the machine guns made good progress. Off to the right, several hundred yards away, the 9th and 10th battalions of the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers, the Tyrones and the Derries, made good progress, despite casualties from a single machine gun up in Tiepful village. They were supported by the 11th Inniskillings, men from Donegal and from Anna, and the 14th Rifles, the Young Citizen Volunteers, the YCV. Both were badly hit by machine gun fire from Thiepville and sustained heavy casualties. The follow-on brigade consisted of the 8th, 9th and 10th Royal Irish Rifles, men from East, West and South Belfast. And although taking heavy casualties moving across no man's land, they went through the German second line and reached the enemy third line and beyond. However, by 10 a.m., enemy artillery fire machine guns from both sides and fierce resistance had effectively prevented any chance of a breakthrough. For the remainder of the day and overnight, there was desperate fighting to hold on to ground gained against increasing enemy counterattacks. Great efforts were made to rescue the wounded, lying in shell holes and collapsed trenches. By the night of the 2nd of July, the division had lost 5,500 men, killed, wounded and missing, and of those, over 2,000 were dead. Many of them lie here still. In 2014, the remains of Sergeant David Blakey, of the 11th Royal Linskin Fusiliers, and an unknown soldier of the Royal Irish Rifles were uncovered during road winding at 20 yards from our gate. They were buried with military honors in Connaught Cemetery, which is down the bottom, uh, across the Somme battlefield 
bodies emerge each year. The Ulster Division won four Victoria Crosses for gallantry. On the night before, the YCV bombing section were distributing hand grenades when a, bo a box spilled and several pins came out. Seeing that many would perish, Private Billy McFadzine threw himself on the bombs and died, but saved his comrades. Captain Eric Bell of the Tyrones won a posthumous VC for beating off counterattacks up on the hill here, and he ended up by throwing trench mortar bombs by hand. Across the valley, Private Robert Quigg of the 12th Rifles and Lieutenant Geoffrey Cather of the 9th Fusiliers both won Victoria Crosses for bringing back large numbers of wounded men. Cather posthumously won it. A fifth VC would be won by Corporal George Sanders of the Leeds Rifles, fighting overnight behind us on the 1st of 2nd of July alongside the Ulster Division in the Schwaben Redoubt. This monument is a memorial to the fallen of the Ulster Division and men from Ulster lost, who lost their lives in the Great War. We meet today to commemorate its opening, 100 years ago today. Carol will now give you a history of the tower. Thank you. A letter from our president, His Royal Highness, the Duke of Gloucester, who sadly can't be with us today. During our lives, we make many decisions, some of them good and some of them bad, which in the course, due course, we regret. When we look back at the past history of our families and our communities, we can identify those who promote creativity, harmony and peace, and those who had different motives. The Ulster Memorial Tower demonstrates two key moments in time. Firstly, in 1921, it expressed the pride taken in the achievements of the 36th Ulster Division, who were part of the British Expeditionary Forces, and also its agony in the numbers of the dead and injured endured by all of Ulster. And then again in 1988, when the tower was in need of refurbishment and the Farset Psalm project, a cross-community group strived for its repair and the Somme Association was formed in 1990 to spotlight a period of history that all of Ulster could be proud of in preference to historical events that persist in dividing our community. My mother was very pleased to be present at the time of the rededication of the tower and to become president of the Somme Association with its wish to demonstrate through its museum how successive generations should understand the courage and the determination of their predecessors to protect their freedom and the values and to the face of international aggression. I am happy to follow in her footsteps and wish to congratulate you on the centenary and hope that the momentum that you have started over the past will continue and carry further into future generations. We will now hear Emma Brown sing Amazing Grace. Lord 
lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my soul to and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The I first be of the Ulster Memorial Tower. On the 16th of November 1918, just five days after the armistice, Sir Edward Carson called for a memorial to commemorate the sacrifice of those from Ulster. An Ulster that included the counties Cavan, Donegal and Monaghan. He had sent a circular to the members of the Ulster Unionist Council suggesting that a memorial should be erected on the battlefield to commemorate the gallant deeds of the Ulster Division, and particularly those who had lost their lives. A fund was set up for the purpose, and he called for the people to pledge towards the memorial fund. This started the process that led to the construction of what we refer to at the time, or sorry, what was referred to at the time as the Ulster Battlefield Memorial Tower. The idea was to have it constructed on the site of the 36 Ulster Division's attack on the 1st of July, 1916. Sir James Craig, another prominent figure, along with Sir Edward Carson, were central to the plans for the Battlefield Memorial. James Craig realised that an appropriate site would be required and this would need someone on the ground. He wrote to the newly appointed Ulster Division's commanding officer, Brigadier General Philip Levinson Gower, to enlist his help. Along with a few former Ulster Division officers and a delegation set out to scout the area of the Ulster Division's divisional attack on the 1st of July, 1916, with the aim of finding the most appropriate site for the memorial. Then James Craig set his mind to the design of the proposed battlefield memorial. The Ulster landmark Helen's Tower, which stands on the Clandyboy estate near Bangor. 
and had been the training ground for the Ulster Volunteer Force and the then 107 Brigade of the Ulster Division had been proposed by Sir James Craig. Helen's tower had been built as a token of a son's love for his mother. So it seemed fitting that to be replicated as Ulster's love for her sons. Sir Edward Carson and Sir James Craig launched a campaign to raise the funds to enable them to build a fitting memorial. At the time, Carson suggested, I suggest that a monument be erected on a suitable site on the battlefield to commemorate for all time the heroic deeds of those men and to that end that a fund be started in which all sympathisers can participate. Later it was announced in the papers that preliminaries to, er the, to the erection at Thiepville of a memorial to the dead of the Ulster Division had now been completed. Readers were also informed that the memorial would take the shape of a modified reproduction of Helen's Tower. Brigadier General Philip Levinson Goyer reported back to the Battlefield Memorial Committee that he had found an appropriate site for this new memorial. The site would stand on what we know today and it was chosen for a number of advantages. It was on the old German front line and marked almost the exact spot where the division carried out its first attack on the 1st of July, 1916. It represents almost the center of the Ulster's divisional front. It can be, it can be seen for a considerable distance up and down the valley and from the railway track and from the road. Plans for the proposed memorial were drawn up by London architects Bowden and Abbott and were based on the original Helen's Tower, with a few minor differences. The steps are different to Helen's Tower because of the, where the trench system is here. And also Helen's Tower is 60 feet tall, where the Ulster Memorial Tower is 70 feet tall. So the construction of the memorial was the next step. The land was given in perpetuity to the people of Ulster by the people of France and to remain so as long as a memorial sat on the site. Today, as we commemorate the 100th anniversary, we thank the people of France for this generous gift. The dedication and the opening ceremonies were set for the 19th of November, 1921. The Lord Primate of All Ireland was to perform the dedication ceremony and Sir Edward Carson was to officially open the Ulster Battlefield Memorial Tower, as it was known. Sadly, after having a pivotal role in the planning and the construction of the new memorial, neither Edward Carson or James Craig were able to attend the ceremony due to ill health. So this fell to Field Marshal Sir Henry Hughes Wilson from County Longford. Sir Henry was the then Chief of the Imperial General Staff of the British Army and one of the most senior British staff officers of the First World War. A delegation had arrived the previous evening in Amiens that included Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig, Commander of the British Expeditionary Forces on the Western Front, the, Dutch, the Duchess of Abercorn, the Marcus and Marquess of Dufferin and Ava and of Londonderry, Lieutenant Colonel Wilfred B. Spender, and the GOC at the time, Brigadier General Ricardo, along with bereaved family members, veterans, and many others. It was a dry day, unlike today, on Saturday the 19th of November, 1921, when the delegation arrived here at Fateville. It was the first time that the group had seen the new memorial on the horizon. The landscape was still full of shell craters, lines of trenches that were still visible to the naked eye and barbed wire still littered the ground. The most reverend, the Lord Primate of all Ireland conducted the dedication ceremony with prayers and words of remembrance in the presence of the Marchiel of France 
Henri Philippe Pétain. Pétain was subsequently appointed to the highest military offices, Vice President of the Supreme War Council, Inspector General of the French Army. Also present on the day was the Prefecture of the Somme, the Sous-Prefet of the Somme and the Sous-Prefet of Peron, very similar to we have today, along with soldiers from the French Army and numerous Maries, Maries from local villages surrounding the Ulster Tower who were still suffering after the long years of fighting. After the official event, the attendees were able to walk through the trenches which still surrounded this memorial. Also present at the opening of the event was the first caretaker of the memorial, Savage, Sergeant Savage from Belfast, who had himself served in the 36th Ulster Division. He spent the next year living in the tower with his French wife, before his role was taken over by Sergeant McMasters from Lisburn. In 1928, the Government of Northern Ireland designated the Ulster Memorial Tower Northern Ireland's National War Memorial. Over the years, the tower received visits from many former veterans from the First World War and bereaved family members. Commemoration events were held over the years to mark important anniversaries. But sadly, during the 70s, the Ulster Memorial Tower fell into disrepair until an unexpected visit to the battlefields in the late 1980s led to where we are today. I would just like to now invite Lieutenant Colonel Baxter Lieutenant Colonel Thomas MBE and Major Montgomery to read out some historical quotes, quotes from the time. The dedication ceremony on the 19th of November 1921 was performed by Sir Henry Wilson in the presence of many distinguished guests, including the Marshal de France. Sir Henry made a speech in French, welcoming the French representatives present. He started by saying, Monsieur, Les Marchiels and faithful officers and men of the glorious army of France, may I say in one word that we Ulster men are immensely proud of the part all of the men of our race took in the titanic struggle for the preservation of right through justice and mercy from the imposition of savage might and the killing of our people and our countries. He finished by saying, and lastly, even before my dreaming eyes, I see the long, silent, suffering percussion of the women of France, always patient, always brave, never complaining, never flinching, the real heroines of this terrible tragedy. King George V, I recall the deeds of the 36th Ulster Division which have more than fulfilled the high opinion formed by me on expecting the force on the eve of its departure for the front. Throughout the long years of struggle, which have now so gloriously ended, the men of Ulster have proved how nobly they fight and die. To Winston Churchill. The record of the 36th Division will ever be the pride of Ulster. At Feet Fall in the Great Battle of Somme on July the 1st, 1916. At Wu Cheat on June the 17th, 1917. In the storming of the Messina Ridge on the Canal de Nord. In the attack on the Hindenburg Line on November the 20th in the same year. On March 21st, 1918, near fontaine la Claire, defending their positions long after they were isolated and surrounded by the enemy. And later, in a month, at Odishi, in the days of backs to the walls, they acquired a reputation for conduct and devotion, deathless in the military history of the United Kingdom, and repeatedly signalized in the dispatches of their commander in chief. We will now have the call to worship. 
Friends, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God to offer unto him our worship, praise, and thanksgiving, to remember proudly all those soldiers from Ulster who fought a good fight, kept the faith, and finished their course in this life. Wherefore, remembering God's presence with us now, let us praise and thank him for the gallantry and resolute courage of all those who fought in the First World War. We shall sing the hymn, O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Please be seated. Let the party change on. We read from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, and verses 7 to 14. This is the Word of God. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. This is the word of God. Let us pray. Lord God, at this solemn moment of remembering 
and recognition, we who have gathered at the Ulster Memorial Tower on this centenary date do so with hearts that are filled with pride and gratitude for what was done to win our freedom, coupled with grief and sorrow at the great cost in human life of this sacrifice. Acknowledging this today, we bow before you with respect and honor for the fallen. This tower stands as a tangible link with our homeland, a reminder to us of our indebtedness, our sacrifice, our story enacted in these fields. With these heavy hearts, we also look upwards to recall your great sacrifice for us when you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place on the cross. He died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good, that we might go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. And with this good news hope before us, we press on, determined to honor the memory of those who were taken from us too soon in these terrible conflicts and committed to living out the example and command of Jesus himself, who taught us as a people when we pray together and using the traditional words to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May all the words that I say to you be in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As Gwiliga, Gora, and Rafakli, Eliga, Jerem, Reeve, and Anyam, the Dio, and Ahar, and Mark, Agus, and Spiradni. Amen. Well, here's a turn up for the books. The soldiers are under cover and the padres are out in the rain, uh, which is a proper reversal of order on a day uh, such as today. Um, I want to thank the organizers for the privilege of being able uh, to share a few words on this very historic and poignant occasion. Um, the Great War was unique in the history of warfare for a number of reasons. It was the first war that had involved mass mobilization of a civilian population. And as a result, it was the first war to suffer mass casualties. But perhaps most relevant for us here today is it was then the first war which was followed by mass remembering. Up until 1919, public memorials to war uh, after a great victory, had usually taken the form of an equestrian statue of uh, a famous general. And you can still see statues such as that all over Europe today. But the very scale of the casualties in what the General Service Medal, the clasp on the General Service Medal says, was the Great War for Civilization, 1914 to 1919, was so vast that there was an instinct that such memorials simply would no longer do. And at first there was a plaster and lath cenotaph, cenotaph's an empty tomb, plaster and lath, lath cenotaph was set up in Whitehall in 1919. And it was the government's intention that it should be removed after that first Armistice Day service. But there was very clearly a public mood that um, the sacrifice of so many people should not be forgotten in the public sphere. 
in the same sense that it wouldn't be forgotten in the homes of many millions of people. So the great imperial architect, Edward Lutyens, was commissioned to design the elegant and simple memorial, which now stands in Whitehall. And memorials began to spring up in other places, uh, near to where I grew up, uh, on a housing estate, which was built in 1920, uh, especially for those returning from the First World War. The streets were given names like Bapholm, Albert, Ange, and of course, Somme. And in the middle of that little estate, off the Craiger Road in Belfast, stands a stone memorial cross, the cross of Jesus Christ, the place where God went deeper into human suffering than even war or disease could go. And he rose on the third day with a kingdom in his hand. And of course, this war memorial here in Deepval, which as we've heard, the first to be built on the Western Front to commemorate the bravery of the soldiers of the nine counties of the historic province of Ulster, who gave their lives in that hellish war, but specifically, of course, associated in the minds of all of us with the 36th Ulster Division and their bravery in that long drawn out ordeal which we call the Battle of the Somme. And of course, mass remembering means individual remembering. Whether they're in great monuments like the one down the road here in Thiepval, covered with the names of the fallen or at the Menin Gate, or in the many little plaques and churches up and down the United Kingdom and Ireland. Because when millions perish, it's very easy to dwell simply on the scale of the deaths, which is truly mind-numbing and forget each of those individual lives. Individual lives. So there were three brothers who lived in the town of Banbridge, County Down. And they worked in the linen industry where the pay was poor and the working conditions were worse. So one day in 1912, they walked from Banbridge to Lisburn and enlisted as regular soldiers in the Royal Irish Rifles. And they learned to take pride in their regiment and its distinctive speedy march. And as country boys, they were already excellent marksmen and had that raw, bony strength found in so many people who have been brought up to help on farms. And the three brothers all played football for the regiment and then for the Corps, and then for the Army. And at the outbreak of war in the summer of 1914, they sailed with the British Expeditionary Force to France. And all their lives, they were proud to be called old contemptibles. And all three were wounded at the retreat from Mons, but not so seriously that they couldn't also fight here at the Somme and in the Third Battle of Passchendaele at Ypres. And just before he left hospital in Ireland to rejoin his regiment in 1916, one of the brothers, called Jimmy, was given a gift of a book of common prayer by his girlfriend and written on the inside with the words, hoping God may spare you and bring you home again. And here's the little book of common prayer that that girl gave to my grandfather a private soldier in the Royal Irish Regiment. And I've no idea how he kept it dry for four years at war. It's wet already, and I've only been standing here for two minutes. The Great War was the end of faith for many. Those who had grown up in an easy peace and a superior culture those who were confident of the onward march of civilization because they had never had their self-confidence shaken, who didn't know the wickedness that men were capable of. And in the century before the war, the churches had domesticated God. They had harnessed him to their own purposes. He had become their asset and their patron instead of their judge and their redeemer. 
and suddenly, in the great cataclysm of total war and in the horrors of the battlefield, the high seemed low and nations halted in their stride and the brief candle was out and what was man to be accounted of? So each of those individuals, whether they died in battle or whether they survived the war bodily and mentally shaken, but still able to take pride in what they had done, we hallow their memory, each one of them. People who God loved with an everlasting love. And we hallow their memory not only for the courage of their actions, but for the greatness of their souls. May God keep you and bring you home again safe. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them.
the first set will be will be done in four batches. Madame Valérie Saint Coton, Sous Prefet de Peron. Minister of State for European Affairs, Thomas Byrne, TD. Lord Keane, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. And Paul Given, MLA, First Minister for Northern Ireland. Her Excellency Mena Rollins, British Ambassador to France. Doug Beattie, MC, MLA, on behalf of the Ulster Unionist Party, and Danny Kinnahan, Veterans Commissioner. General Colin Weir, DSO, MBA, Colonel of the Royal Irish Regiment, General of the Division, Xavier Dazigma, uh, Colonel Paul Kenny, Kennedy, sorry, Defence Force Ireland, and Brigadier Senior, CBA 38 Brigade. Monsieur Claude Cliquet, Marie Albert. Monsieur Max Potier, Marie Thepfal. Monsieur Fabrice Coulson, Marie Autuil. Monsieur Didier Saman, Mary Guillemont, Monsieur Cyril Cornell, Mary Ocean Village, and Monsieur Roger Russell, Mary uh, Mesnel. Anne Le Marie, on behalf of the President de la Commune de la Coquelico. Uh, the Consul Regional des Hautes de Francais, Madame Duzelay Brilon, and Frederic Bruru, Director de the Service Departmental de Veterans de la Somme. Colonel Pushnik, the Defence Attaché Germany to France, 
Colonel Haché, the Defence Attaché, Canada, to France. Colonel McKinstry, the Defence Attaché, New Zealand, to France. And Colonel Doulet, the Defence Attaché, Australia, to France. Colonel R.G.B. Heard on behalf of the Royal Enniskillen Fusiliers Association and Xavier Pouquet on behalf of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Mr. Philip Morrison, MBE, BEM, Royal British Legion, Northern Ireland. Mr. Ken Martin, Royal British Legion, the Republic of Ireland. Rod Bedford, the Royal British Legion, National Officers and Trustees. Mr. Edward Stevenson, Grand Master of the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland. Mr. Alan McFarland, Chairman of the Somme Association. We will now sing the final hymn, God as with silent hearts we bring to mind. During this hymn, there will be an opportunity for local councils starting with Belfast in an alphabetical order and an opportunity for all other organisations who wish to lay a wreath to place a wreath.
up, Pauline. Shut. Stand up, Pauline. Please, hold. Stand up, Pauline. Slow. Hold. So let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, so that at the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the Church, the Queen, the Commonwealth, the President and people of Ireland, and all mankind, peace and concord, and to us and all his servants, eternal life, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Emma Brown will now sing, You'll Never Walk Alone. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up and don't be afraid of the dark at the end of the storm is a golden sky and the sweet silver song of the
Colin McFarlane, Chairman of the SOM Association, will now say some closing remarks and thanks. Um, earlier, uh, Carol gave you an account of the opening of the tower. Uh, over the years, it was a site of pilgrimage, particularly for the 50th anniversary of the battle in 1966, when many of the veterans were still alive. Up until the early 1970s, it had a resident caretaker. However, in 1988, when Dr. Ian Adamson brought a group from the Farset Somme project on a battlefield tour, he discovered the building was in a dilapidated state. If you wish to see the memorial room behind me here, a note on the door informed you that when contacted, a lady from Tiepfel would come down and let you in. On return to Northern Ireland, he lobbied the government to have the memorial refurbished. And on the 1st of July, 1989, the tower was rededicated in the presence of Her Royal Highness Princess Alice, Duchess of Gloucester, and the Somme Association was founded to manage the tower and enable its opening for visitors. Dr. Ian Adamson OB became the founding chairman of the Somme Association and remained in post for 25 years. In 1994, the visitor center you see behind me here adjacent to the tower was opened and a full-time caretaker appointed. The upper portion of the memorial tower provides accommodation for the Somme Association staff. In March 2004, the Somme Association perched the Eightful Wood down the bottom here, and in 2000, July 2006, uh, a reconstructed section of the trenches, the original frontline trenches, was opened. We conduct guided tours of the trench system by prior appointment. For the past 25 years, the Somme Association has carried out a service of remembrance here on the 1st of July. We have a similar service for the 16th Irish Division at Guillemot. The 16th Irish Division emerged from John Redmond's Irish Volunteers, formed to fight for Home Rule. They attacked Guillemot on the 3rd of September 1916 and Zhongxi on the 9th of September. They suffered casualties of the same magnitude as the Ulster Division and afterwards were deployed into a quiet sector alongside the Ulster Division at Messine in Flanders. The division spent a year together in the line, and it was said at the time that if the war had ended at that point, so good was the relationships between them that the history of the island of Ireland would not have developed as it did. The divisions fought side by side to take Messine Ridge in June 1917, and again at Friesenberg Ridge on the Third Battle of Ypres, before being virtually destroyed in the German offensive of March 1918. Now, I'm originally from the Glenelli Valley in the Sperren Mountains of County Tyrone, and not long ago um, I carried out a study uh, of those from the valley who had fallen in the Great War. Of the 13 fallen soldiers, seven were from a Protestant Unionist tradition and six from a Catholic Nationalist tradition. They lie buried in cemeteries or still on the battlefield here in France and in Flanders but they're remembered here at the Ulster Memorial Tower. Before closing, I'd like to give some thanks to the Padres for conducting the service uh, and to all those who participated in this centenary commemoration, particularly the officers, NCOs, and other ranks of the 1st and 2nd Battalions, the Royal Irish Regiment, uh, the band, bugles, pipes, and drums of the Royal Irish Regiment, 38th Brigade, and the band of two brigade, Defence Forces Ireland. And the teachers and pupils of Collège Charles de Foucault uh, from Albert, who I think are going to see us shortly. A special thanks goes to the Department of Finance of the Northern Ireland Executive, who have ensured that this commemoration could take place. The defence section of the British Embassy in Paris, whose support has been excellent, excellent throughout. The civil and military authorities of the Département du Somme, whose support over the years has been invaluable to the tower. And the Commonwealth War Graves, our close colleagues in ensuring that this site continues to survive as a fitting memorial. Particular thanks go to Nigel and Anne Davies, the custodians of the tower. They have soldiered on here, believe it or not, living in this lonely stone tower throughout the pandemic lockdown. And a very special thanks to Carol Walker, director of the Somme Association, and to Colossant Trevor Ross, our military liaison officer from Tyrol Irish, 
They have worked tirelessly over the past year to make this centenary service the success it has been. Thank you all for attending.
an honour to be here on behalf of the Irish Government at the Ulster Tower. Um, it is essential uh, that we commemorate all those who died in battle in World War I, knowing uh, that the soldiers commemorated here are from all parts, all nine counties of Ulster, and that many people from across the island of Ireland, north and south, uh, fought uh, in World War I and died in World War I. And it is critical uh, that we continue to honour their memories uh, and to work always for peace and reconciliation both at home uh, and indeed across the globe. It's an honour for me to be here today on this historic occasion to mark 100 years of the Ulster Tower, which memorialises the sacrifice that was made by the men of the 36th Ulster Division, and it remembers those who served uh, right across Ireland in that First World War. Uh, and the connections with the Ulster Division and, of course, the Irish Division is something that we always need to remember, where people stood side by side, irrespective of their religion or indeed their uh, identity, whether they were British or Irish, they shed blood together here in the trenches and stood in common cause uh, for the freedoms that we now enjoy today. Uh, I personally, uh, when I'm here, think about uh, those people across Northern Ireland where I see the cenotaphs in towns and villages and you see their names. Um, but whenever you come here to France and you see the headstones in the cemeteries, you see the memorial here, it really brings it home. The immense sacrifice, particularly when I think of the age of people, they're 19, 20, 21. You know, in the early stages of their life, they gave their lives so that we were able to have the freedoms today and to protect us. So this is a, a huge honour for me as the first Minister for Northern Ireland representing our country to be here on this historic occasion.